Spirit, you are welcome here. We want the will of God to be accomplished in this place, but not just here. Everywhere that people are tuned in, everywhere that people are watching. Father, we know we may be separated by miles in the natural, but from your perspective, we are all gathered around your throne, praising and worshiping our Savior. And Father, I, I just bless you so much and thank you for your patience. Sometimes we get to thinking that we're so much more than what we really are. And sometimes, I guess, Father, maybe that frustrates you if I can use that term. And sometimes you probably get a good laugh out of it. But either way, you are patient with us as a loving Father. And you work with us so much to bring about your will. So I pray that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened to the fullness of what you are doing in our lives, in this ministry here, and in ministries that are represented wherever people are watching. Thank you for tonight, Father. Thank you for your presence here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, praise God. Okay, commence to be friendly. Glory to God. Ah, air conditioning feels good. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I checked it uh, to see how much, you know, I mean, how cold, and it was blowing really nice. Uh, it's just that with this building, and there's no insulation, it's just, you know, wood, tar paper, shingles. The heat comes through. Nothing you can do about that. So thank God for air conditioners that put up a fight. <laughs> Hallelujah. It feels so much better in here than it has recently. Thank you, Jesus. If you do not already have your tickets for this coming Friday's Dragons game, you need to see Judy Nelson. Judy has the tickets, so if you purchased yours, see her and she'll make sure that you get your tickets. And let's see here. <laughs> Last day of July, man. Glory to God. Can you believe it? <sighs> Pretty soon we'll be in the 20s. That's okay. I'm talking the 2020s, not the age 20s. <laughs> some of us passed that a long time ago. <laughs> and some of us are very grateful those years are over. Oh, yes, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Anyway, praise God. Thank you guys for being here. Those of you watching, thank you. Appreciate uh, you taking your time to log on, watch our services. It does mean a lot. Would you please turn to Psalm... 27. Psalm 27. I'm going to point some things out to you today. Well, tonight that the Lord was pointing out to me. And I, I trust it will be a real encouragement to you. I'm going to give you a moment to turn there. Psalm 27. And here in Tom, Psalm 27... We're going to begin reading in verse 1. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Now stop right there. The way this is written, it is not written in a... Um, well, I don't know all the grammatical terms. But the way this is written, it's from the perspective of an established fact an established understanding and an established belief. It is not written as a, what we might call a confession of faith over those things that aren't as though they were. 
This is, this is written in a way to where the person writing, which is David, but he's sharing something that he has come to understand and it is an established truth in his life. Now, when we read this, the question comes up, is this truly the relationship that we have with God? I don't mean, are we born again? What I mean is, out of our born again existence, is this truly what we know and understand about the Lord? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Not my born again, but my salvation. The completeness of what I need in life. Now, we're trained to make something like this as a, as a confession. You know, the Lord is my light. Yes, amen. The Lord is my salvation. Yes, amen. We say that because we recognize it in Scripture as something that has been put in the Bible. But is it a statement of fact for us as an individual? Now, as we continue reading in this, there are some factors that are going to come to life, to light, that will help us, I guess you could say self-examine our own lives as to whether or not we truly believe the Lord is my light and my salvation. And it's interesting because as this is written, it doesn't say the Lord is light and salvation. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. Regardless of how you see it, for you, me, for me. And then he continues and he says, look, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. There's another definitive statement of what I believe and what I know is true for me. Is that a truth for us as individuals? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Well, when he writes this about whom shall I fear and whom shall I be afraid? And then he goes into verse 2. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Okay, I understand that David encountered a whole lot of opposition from people. I'm talking about humans. People that, um, well, Philistines, you know, Canaanites, or whoever it was that came up against him. But now when you look at this, the Lord is my light and my salvation, and the Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? Don't think in terms of simply an invading army. Think in terms of your life. What kind of circumstances have arisen that have produced fear in your life? And it can, I mean about anything. What the doctor said. What your bank account says. What the boss says when you walk in and he starts telling you it's been nice to have you here. You know, what has happened that has instilled fear? Not, the, not a startledness as when somebody jumps out from around the corner, boo, and you go, oh, you scared me. No, not that. Not that. The kind of thing to where it impacts you and you're struggling to eat, to sleep, to think coherently. This fear. This fear. Who is your enemy? Who has been your enemy? And when he says the wicked, even my enemies and foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Okay, is that true for us as individuals? Now here's what I mean. We go through a lot of stuff. And if we look back over our lives, how many times <clears throat> could, can we say, well, you know, that devil, Satan, you know, man, I'm telling you what, he, he got me good. W whatever the situation would be. How many times has it really been a successful Satan or 
a lack of trust on our part. Because when we come to this place of, of believing the Lord is my light, my salvation, the strength of my life, then what can the devil do? And see, a lot of people want to blame everything bad that happens on Satan. Well, not even Satan can control the will of a human being. God doesn't. And you know what's really sad is that a lot of Christians, they don't believe that. They believe that, you know, well, Satan's going to make somebody do something. He's, he can't. He can't make anybody do anything. You have to make decisions in your life to accommodate, I'll put it like this, his suggestions. His, why don't you go do this? You have to make decisions in your life to accommodate what you might call things that would satisfy the flesh. And I'm not simply meaning uh, immoral behavior. It's anything to where you feel justified. You know, you lash out at somebody, and I mean you just give them the what for, and then somebody asks you, why did you do that? And you just say, well, they had it coming. Okay, you were satisfying the flesh at that moment. And he says here, look, because the Lord is my light, and because the Lord is my salvation, and because the Lord is the strength of my life, I am not going to be afraid of what comes up in life. And as far as I'm concerned, my foes, <laughs> they're going to stumble and fall. Fear will stumble and fall. Anxiety will stumble and fall. I will not succumb to these things. He says, though a host, verse 3, should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me. In this I will be confident. Or will I be confident? I, I have confidence in the Lord because he's my light, he's my salvation, and he is the strength of my life. I will not fear. How many times in our lives as Christians have we had these thoughts where everything's going wrong? Nothing's going right. In other words, a host of failure is surrounding you. I just don't know how much more of this I can take. It's just one thing after another. It's just this. It's just that. Well, what you're describing is <laughs> you're in the middle of a bunch of problems. But if the Lord is your light, your salvation, and the strength of your life, then you know what? Your heart will not fear, and you will have a confidence, a confidence to know this too shall pass. You know, even in a worst case scenario, it's like the Apostle Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We should have no fear of death. Now, I know there's this apprehension of closing our eyes for the last time. You know, what's going to happen? I mean, the, you know, the, that transition from this life into eternity. Okay, I understand that. But when it comes to fear... There should be no fear. None. Because if we have this confidence in the Lord, then we know whatever happens, I win. If I live, I win. If I die, I win. I win. I can't lose, no matter what. And then now look at this. Verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. One thing have I desired. One. One thing. I'm not seeking after healing. I'm not seeking after prosperity. I'm not seeking after a solution to my problems. I'm not seeking after a spouse. I'm not seeking at... In other words, we, we can create a really long list on this one. He says, look, because I've come to the realization that the Lord is my light and my salvation and the strength of my life, 
because I have come to the place of fully comprehending this reality, then I now am at a place <clears throat> to where one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that is what I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This is the one thing that will satisfy me. And this right here, this fourth verse, is very similar to what Jesus said over there in Matthew about seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Part of the problem that we have as believers, we do not have this, verse 4, as our one desire. Instead, you know, we want to get in prayer lines and receive impartations. But you know what? If verse 4 is how we live, we receive an impartation. And it comes directly from God. Too many Christians are running to and fro, conferences, camp meetings, and so forth, because they want to receive a word from the Lord. <clears throat> well, you know what? <clears throat> if verse 4 is your desire, if this is you, you will receive a word from the Lord. And you don't have to run all over the place seeking for some mighty prophet of God to speak into your life. If verse 4 is what you're really after, then you don't worry about how soon will my healing manifest. You'll understand. Look, God's made a promise to me. And this relationship reflected in verse 4 means more to me than the healing of my body. Does that mean that your body won't be healed? No. What it means is this relationship revealed in verse 4 means more to me than the healing of my body. Now, I know he's already promised that by Jesus' stripes I was healed. But this relationship means more to me than the healing of my body. It means more to me than getting my bills paid. Even though I intend to pay my bills, and I know that he will supply. I know he will. But this right here, verse 4, this means more. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. In other words, this will be my fellowship. This will be my life. This is the one thing that I desire in life. As Christians, this is not, <laughs> this fourth verse, I do not believe that this is the standard for most Christians. Pastor, you got, got any new revelation? I get asked that from time to time. Got any new, new revelation? W why? What do you mean? Do I have any... Well, you know, God revealed anything new to you? You know what? Maybe if verse 4 was your life, then God would be revealing things to you. What? You think he only reveals things to certain people? Come on. You think that he doesn't want to reveal things to you? When verse 4 is our one thing. Our life will be notably different. Because we're going to understand, <laughs> he's my strength, he's my everything. And so, I have as my one desire, this relationship with him. This is what I want. I want to seek after him. And notice in verse 5, he says, you see, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. <laughs> He's saying, look, when trouble comes, I don't have to worry about it. Because he's my strength. He's my shield. He's my life. He's my strength. He's all of this to me. And when trouble does arise, you know what? He's going to be there for me. He's going to, as he says, you know, hide me in his pavilion. In other words, his presence will be notable to me. I will know that I am there with him. And when I have that knowing that I am there with him, I am not going to be overwhelmed with fear. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to get worked up. I'm not going to be... See, a lot of parents, if they would do verse 4... They wouldn't be so worried about their children. And man, I've heard that from Christians. 
Man, I'm just worried about these kids. You know, I'm just worried about, why? Why, why are you worried about the kids? You're trying to be God. You're trying to be sure they turn out right. Okay, so how are you going to do that when they have free will? How are you going to control them? How are you going to make them be a poster child Christian? How are you going to do that? You can't. All you can do is train. They must apply the training. All you can do is point them to the Lord and live it in front of them. Beyond that, man, it's totally up to them. And if, if we had, as Christians, this kind of life, that's being described here, there's going to be that confidence of knowing, you know what, even if stuff happens, even in a time of trouble, he's going to be there for me. I don't have to worry about it. Even in a time of trouble, this is an assumptive statement, meaning, well, right now everything's not so bad, but I do know this, I live in a fallen world, sooner or later, there's going to be a time of trouble. I don't know what it'll be. I don't know how it's going to manifest. But sooner or later, something's going to happen that I sure don't like. But when that time comes, I know this. God is going to hide me in his pavilion, and in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. He shall lift me up and set me upon a rock. And he says... Verse 6, and because he will set me upon a rock, now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. I want you to try and capture this, this image. He says, in a time of trouble, he's going to hide me. He's going to set me up upon a rock. When that happens, my head shall be lifted up above my enemies. Instead of me being down there at their level, at the level of my problems, to where everywhere I look, everywhere I turn, trouble, trouble, problems, problems, strife, all this kind of stuff. He says, instead of that, I now have been lifted up upon a rock. My head is lifted up above my enemies, meaning everything I see is not enemy. I can see clearly what the Lord is doing. And I don't have to worry about this. He has lifted me up, and <laughs> I'm looking down on the troubles. I'm looking down on the problems, I'm looking down on whoever and whatever is trying to, as he says earlier, you know, eat up my flesh. I'm looking down on it. I am up here with him. And he says, therefore, you know what? I'm going to offer joy in his tabernacle, sacrifices of joy, praises unto the Lord. I'm going to sing. Why? Because I know that he is there for me. Because this one thing I desire, and it's out of me doing verse 4, all of this other works into place. When I make the decision that this relationship with him is my one desire, my priority desire, the number one desire in my life, I come to the full understanding he's my light, my salvation, my strength. And when trouble shows up, he lifts me upon a rock. And so I'm going to praise him. I Listen, I know what he's going to do for me. Therefore, I will praise him now before the time of trouble arises. Because I know what he'll do. I know how he's going to help me. And you know, as I was going through this, the Lord was impressing upon me that if, if you do not learn how to praise now, in a time of peace, then when the troubles come, it's going to be a struggle for you to fully into, enter into praise. 
Because too many Christians, when problems show up, oh, Pastor, tears and crying. I don't know what I'm going to do. Everything stinks. Everything's lousy. It's this and this. And, you know, just give me this long speech about how bad life is. <laughs> In other words, you're eyeball to eyeball with all your problems. Is that right? Oh, yeah, Pastor, they're everywhere. Then you know what? This relationship with God is not your one desire. Because if it were, you would know to trust him and know he's going to lift you up, put you on that rock, and your head will be lifted up above all the problems, and you're not going to see the storm. You're going to be lifted above the storm. You ever, if you've ever flown, there are times when there, there is a storm coming, and the pilots will go up above the storm, and up above the storm, it's beautiful. You don't even know there's a storm below you. I, if that's happened, you know, I've, I've flown many times over the years, you know, ministry trips and so forth. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're making our final approach into, you know, whatever the city is. And it's like, man, it's beautiful, sunny and all this other. You look down, you see the tops of the clouds. Well, then they go down below the clouds. And then all of a sudden, what is this? You know, lightning and thunder and rain and all this. So where'd the sun go? Well, we're no longer above it. Up above it, it was a beautiful, clear day. And God is saying, look, <laughs> when verse 4 is your life and your relationship, you're going to be up on that rock. And verse 5, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me. Future tense. The trouble's not here right now, but I know this, just a matter of time. And some folks would say, what a negative confession. Every one of us in here knows sooner or later, something's going to happen. You know, it just may be something minor. You know, like you got to get something fixed or what. I don't know. But he says, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me. The trouble's not here, but I know when it shows up, I'm ready for it. And so there, therefore, because I know what he's going to do for me, I can praise him. I, I'll worship him now because I already know I've got the victory. I already know that when trouble shows up, my head is going to be lifted up above the problems. I'm going to be able, my vision will be clear. I'll be able to hear the Lord. I'll be able to see what he's doing. I will have an understanding of what's going on, what he's doing on my behalf. And I won't be distracted by all the stuff, all the things that people are doing and so forth. So you know what? I'm going to praise him now. And look, guys, this is a major problem for so many Christians. They don't praise the Lord. They just don't. They come in <laughs> and they bring their problems with them. You know, well, rough at home, rough on the job, this bad, that bad, and so on and so forth. So they come in, and it's like they bring the host of troubles with them in a figure of speech. And they're surrounded by the problems. And so there they are, you know, and, and <laughs> they, they won't praise. They won't worship the Lord because they choose not to. They, they're focusing on the problems. Yeah, well, Brother Martin, you just don't understand. No, I do understand. This is why in verse 6, he says, look, I already know what the Lord's going to do for me. I know ahead of time. When trouble knocks on the door, God is going to lift me up. God is going to be my strength. He's going to be everything to me. So you know what? I'm going to offer praises now. I'm not going to wait and try to praise after the problems hit. I'm not going to wait until I'm saturated with all kinds of emotional sorrow before I lift my hands and start praising God. I will develop a habit of praise now so that when the trouble does show up, the praise is going to be a natural reaction. I'm already accustomed to doing it. Therefore, it's not going to be such an effort to do it. I already know how. I already know what to do. And he says, Hear, O Lord, verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou said, Seek my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Okay, now let me throw this one out. How many of you have ever been ministered to by the Lord 
And he has said something along the lines of, I want you to give me so much time. I mean, he's done that with me. How many of you have had a, a something on the inside to where you know that the Lord is wanting you to spend time with him? But has your response been, my heart has said unto the Lord, thy face, Lord, will I seek. This is not a statement of, well, yeah, I mean, it's a good intention that I'll do this. No, this is a, okay, this is what you want, then this is what I'm going to do. This is a statement of, I'm doing it. I hope you're ready for me because here I come. <laughs> it's a statement of, I'm doing it. It's not a statement of good intentions. It's a statement of an oncoming action. And so therefore, he says, look, you told me to seek you. Okay, I will. I will seek you. It's not going to be an option for me. It's what I'll do. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. In other words, when the people that are closest to me, call it family, when the people who are closest to me are rejecting me, he says, you know what? That's okay. It's, it's not okay, but I won't suffer a diminishing in my life because the Lord is going to take me up. The Lord will be there for me. If my family rejects me, he won't. He will be there for me. And then he says, verse 11, Teach me thy way, O Lord. Lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. In other words, he's saying, okay, I want you to show me what you want me to do and lead me where he says in a plain path let, let me put it like this um, just make it clear what you want and I'll do it make it clear what decision I, may, I need to make but see if you don't have the verse 4 relationship going on it's going to be hard for you to receive this instruction from him this one thing do I desire and that is to have this, this ongoing intimate fellowship with you he says, verse 12, Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. Do you realize that one of the greatest false witnesses you will ever encounter is you? <laughs> yeah, your emotions. I can't do nothing. I'm nothing. I'll never be a success in life. I'll never be. You know what? The moment you become satisfied with less than desirable circumstances is the moment you are no longer going to make progress into God. Because when you become satisfied, okay, let me, let me help you understand this a little bit better. Well, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have a whole lot in life. Okay, what's that mean? Well, you know, we had food, but I mean, we didn't have a whole lot of nice things and so forth. But, you know, mom and dad, they loved us. And, and uh, I mean, we, we were all right. We were okay. So then, have you accepted that is the standard for your life? Too many people do. They allow their environment to dictate their future. And the moment you let your environment dictate your future, I think you understand what I mean by that. As long as you let that happen, you're done for. You're, you're, if you have been raised with less than, and that is what you accept as you continue to age, you're going to have less than. You're going to live like that. And that's how you're going to perceive life and God working in your life. You're just going to see less than. Now, don't misunderstand this. Don't walk out of here and think, well, he said, you know, if we change our perspective that we're all going to have, you know, riches and wealth. No, no, no. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is you can't let your circumstances and your environment create the image of how you are supposed to live. Right here, the Bible. This is supposed to create the image of how you're supposed to live. One thing do I desire. One thing do I desire. 
And I know that out of that desire, me seeking Him, me having that relationship, I know that my life can change. It doesn't have to be like this. It can be different. But when you're constantly reminded of your circumstances, let's say that, you know, every time you get together with family, it's just a constant reminder of the, of the don't have, of the less than, of the not going to be. Constant reminder. And yet right here, God has said, that's not how I see it. <laughs> that's not my plan for you. And so where he says, false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty, your flesh can be the most cruel thing to you. Your emotions. Those kind of, those, those thoughts that want to continue to reinforce, call it failure, call it whatever you want. And he's saying, you know what? That kind of stuff is a false witness. The true witness is in the word of God. It is God's declaration of who you are in Christ. He says in verse 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's you. You're in the land of the living. <laughs> and he says, I had fainted. In other words, think of it like this. I would have come to the conclusion, what's the use? Why keep trying unless I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord? Why keep trying? Why keep pressing? Why keep doing this? Why keep confessing and declaring his word? Why keep walking in faith, believing all this stuff? I haven't seen anything change. <laughs> I wonder why. And he says, you know what? I'd have just thrown up my hands and quit. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Unless I had this belief on the inside of me that God was going to be there for me, watch over me, protect me, provide for me, help me, guide me, strengthen me, do all of this. Unless I, unless I had believed that this is what was going to happen, I would have lived in despair and felt like this is as good as it gets. No, it's not. It's not. No matter how good it is in your life right now, it can be better. Don't think in terms of money. Just think in terms of life experience. No matter what it's like right now, it can be better. Let, let's say that, I mean, let's say that you have really bad living circumstances. It's not good where you live. The worst thing you can do is keep walking into those circumstances and saying, this is it. Not, not verbally, but on the inside. When's it going to change? I don't get it, man. Why? Why me? And God is saying, because. <laughs> you just answered your question. When you lift up your hands in despair, instead of lifting up your hands in praise, you are declaring to yourself what you really believe. And he is saying, look, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, I would have been filled with despair. I would have felt like, what's the use? I would have felt like there's, nothing's going to change. I would have felt like this is just how it is. And God is saying, no, no. You know, the Apostle Paul went through a lot of junk in life. In fact, what he went through in his life is beyond what all of us combined are going to go through in our lives. And he said, you know what? In spite of it all, I've learned to be content. He talked about all the, the beatings and so forth and, and, and some of the encounters that he had uh, experienced. And he said, but the Lord delivered me from them all. He had a belief. You know what? You want to lock me up? You can lock me up. But I'll get out. <laughs> Somehow, I, I will not stay in here. I will leave. I will be gone. That's why I can say rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice because I'm not stuck here. And then the day did come that he realized, okay, Lord, I see my time here is finished. And then he writes that letter to 2 Timothy. Run a good race. You know, I, I've accomplished everything. And now, Timothy, take it and go. And look at this. 
in verse 14. He says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now look at this. Chapter 27, verse 1 through 13 is his testimony of his relationship with God. And then it's like he's saying, guys, now that I've told you all about this and what God will do in a person's life, listen to me when I tell you, wait on the Lord. And then he says, be of good courage. Wait on the Lord. Make verse 4 your lifestyle. Wait on the Lord. Seek him. Do this. And everything that I've written that he has done for me, he will do for you. That will be you that is lifted up above your enemies. That will be you that is seated up there on that rock. That will be you that sees the victory. That will be you that overcomes. Because God will do all these things for you. <laughs> Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. One of the things that would be so beneficial for a lot of Christians that struggle with all this, when all of the junk starts beating on the door, bearing down, you make a confession, Lord, I am waiting on you. And I say, I am of good courage. I am of good courage, Lord. And I know you are strengthening my heart. I will wait on you. And you begin to speak that. Just keep speaking it. <laughs> Where he says, be of good courage. Wait on the Lord. Tell yourself, I am filled with good courage. Because I am waiting on the Lord. I am not going to try and fix everything myself. I am waiting on the Lord. I am being lifted up above all the troubles. I am being placed on this rock with him. I will look down on the problems. I will be strengthened. I will be protected. God, you are with me. I will be of good courage. I am of good courage. Good courage is me. <laughs> it fills my heart. It fills my mind. It fills my life. I am waiting on you, God. And you are strengthening my heart. When you do this, your life begins to change. And one of the keys in this, this whole thing of waiting on the Lord, one of the best ways to wait on the Lord, in verse 6, Therefore what will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. And when he says here in verse 6, Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. The image of this is not just, hey Lord, whoopee doo, I'm here, hallelujah. No, the image of this is where it talks about a sacrifice of joy. It's giving the image of somebody who is, well the word sacrifice here, it's literally talking about the kind of sacrifice where you, you know, butcher an animal. Like the law said, you know, kill this, kill that, and the blood and all that. It's almost like he's saying, if I have to sacrifice my flesh, figuratively speaking now, because this phrase of joy, part of it is talking about, I will shout with joy. I will shout, I will sacrifice my fleshly emotions as I shout for joy. Even though everything looks really bad, and even though everybody around me may think, well, you're kind of dumb the way you're right. No, 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 uh-uh. You know, you live the way you want to live, but me, I'm going to be up here on this rock with God. I will be looking down on my problems, and I will see clearly the victory that God has promised to me. I will shout with joy unto my Lord. I will sing praises unto my God. Look over in um, Psalm 33. Look here in verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. That, phrase, that word comely, natural, normal. Something that just happens because you are righteous. It is 
a byproduct of righteousness. In other words, he's saying, look, it's normal for the righteous to do this. Okay, then if that's normal for the righteous to do that, what would be abnormal? A righteous person who's not doing this. Are you born again? Yes. Then you are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. That means it is normal, it is comely for you to praise the Lord. And if you don't, that is abnormal. Now, some people might get offended at that. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just telling you, God says it's normal for you to praise. So if you're not praising, then you, you're doing that which is not normal. And then he says, look, jump to verse 20. He says, our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. And it goes right along with what we just read over there in chapter 27. He says, for our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. Praise is normal for the believer. Praise is normal. It's abnormal when a Christian doesn't. The reason for that, in part, is because your born-again spirit has an affinity for Jesus. It has a love for him. I mean, there's a connection there with him. And your born-again spirit wants to praise. I'm not talking about everybody runs the aisles. That's not what I'm talking about. But at least where you are, there in the pew, I mean, if you're not going to stand, that's up to you. But at least when you're sitting, you're involved. You're, you're doing it. You know, well, you know, I don't, you know, my hip hurts tonight. My knee hurts tonight or whatever. Okay, well, you know what? Then sit there and praise. <laughs> if you don't feel like standing, you know, I've been on my feet all day long because of my job. My legs are kind of tired. Okay, sit down and praise. Lift your hands. Worship the Lord. Because that's normal for a believer. Hey, even Jesus got tired at times. He could, he could fall asleep on a boat in the middle of a storm. <laughs> that's tired. <laughs> Praise is normal for a believer. Be of good courage. Wait upon the Lord and he will strengthen your heart. Glory to God. That is pure victory. Hallelujah. Go ahead and stand. Father, I'll be the first one to admit that I haven't done what I've just seen in Psalm 27. I haven't done it enough. I haven't done it consistently and that's wrong and father I need to do better about that but father there are some folks they hardly do it at all I'm asking you to I'm asking you for a holy conviction in our lives concerning Psalm 27 verse 4 that we would make that our life that this relationship and fellowship with you would be the one desire that we have I thank you, Father, and I thank you that the, the righteous are bold as a lion and that courage is there for us. Father, in, in that, that movie, The Wizard of Oz, that lion was trying to find courage, but Father, we have it because we have your life in us. And I thank you now for strengthening our heart. Father, I praise you for your word. It, the more we dig into it, the more we realize how much more there is to dig out. And I thank you for that. So Father, your word, it has gone forth here tonight. And I just say it will not return void, but it will accomplish in our lives your will. And not just for those of us here, but for those who are watching and those listening as well. So thank you so much. And I thank you, Father, again, that by Jesus' stripes we were healed. And I just declare healing to be a manifested reality in our bodies because this is your will. So I praise you for it, Father. And as we leave tonight, I thank you again that all of our need is met according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I thank you for watching over us, being our shield, our strength, our protector, and watching over us all the way home. And may our homes be filled with your presence and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Well, folks, listen, if you do have an offering tonight, go ahead and bring it up before you leave. Have a blessed and wonderful evening. And those of you watching, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Look forward to being with you again this coming Sunday. Have a blessed evening.